My guest today is Brian Geneseo. Brian, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? It's been a long time. It's been too long. I uh, I moved away. I don't know if you know this, like seven years ago. <laughs> and I don't I, think I've seen I, you since. Yeah, I'm aware. We miss you. <laughs> oh, thanks so much. I miss you guys, too. Uh, tell me, what are you doing these days? You're not doing the same thing you were doing seven years ago. I know that. No, no. Uh, I, I'm an engineering manager at uh, ConAcademy.org. Ah, excellent. Uh, you were telling me about a project that Khan is doing right now that you're heavily involved in. Uh, yeah. What's going on? Yeah, so we have this big backend, right? Uh, it's a good million lines of Python code, Python 2.7. Um, you may be aware that Python 2.7 end of life about two years ago. And uh, the problem with that, though, is that you can't just go to Python 3. It's not a backwards compatible upgrade. And along with that, there's a whole bunch of new APIs. And so we need to rewrite our backend. Um, and it's big. It, there's a lot of stuff going on at uh, Khan Academy. And <laughs> I've never been involved in a, in a backend rewrite this large uh, until now. Um, but the concept was terrifying <laughs> when we started out. And we've come up yeah. with a mechanism to, to do this, uh, incremental rewrites, where it's tiny amounts is being ported over to the uh. new system. And it's kind of like we're rebuilding the airplane while we're flying, as opposed to a Big Bang rewrite, which everybody says doesn't work. Um, well, it or, might work. But it might work. Uh, uh, you're probably <laughs> obsolete again by the time you get done. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So um, we're using we're using incremental rewrites to uh, rewrite this backend, not service by service, not model by model, but literally field by field, me moving things over. Like, so like it's field, uh, like field in the database, field on the screen, that sort of thing. Field in the API is kind of the way we think about it. Oh, so, it's a backend, get it? Yeah, yeah. So we're, you know, we're if there's if there's a model, um, let's say it's a user model, and the user has a username, um, we can we're just moving one field at a time over to this new system. And so there are thousands and thousands of these fields, as you can probably imagine, when you look at all the data models that you're exposing. And uh, we're, we're doing it one at a time in this incremental, um, safe way. Oh, uh, well, that's, uh, that's a big project. How do you get started? How do we get started? Well, um, you know, first we had to kind of decide, are we going to stick with Python? <laughs> um, and, and the answer is? The answer is no. <laughs> we are not sticking with Python. Um, we, uh, we're, we moved to Go. Interesting. Uh, for Why a handful go? of reasons. Um, well, number one, we, we realized that after 10 years of having a code base, we needed to have type safety. And uh, we just keep getting bitten by um, dynamic typing. Um, right. You know, I, I've seen dynamic typing working on large projects before, but it really requires a lot of like test-driven development um, discipline sure. that uh, you know after 10 years we just we just didn't have uh, and so you'd change something and you break something somewhere else and you'd have no idea so uh, we moved our JavaScript to types many many years ago and had a huge success and we were pretty clear that uh, whatever language we chose going forward had to have types uh, it had to be more performant than Python um, and so that kind of ruled out Python 3 um, and so we chose Go uh, and then the next step like was trying to figure out, do we want to port the monolith as it was, or do we want to break it up into services? And uh, we've wanted services for a long time. Um, these aren't microservices, but they aren't um, large services either. Uh, it's We're breaking it up into 27 different services um, so far. And, um, and, and yeah, and so then the question is, how do you, how do you make sure that you change your architecture, change your language, but you don't bring the site down. Right. And you know, there was a lot of estimating, <laughs> a lot of heuristics. 
we came up with an estimate of about 47 person years worth of work. That you had done or that you have to do the other in front of you? That we would have to do in front of us. Uh, you know, we're about halfway through that now. Yeah. Um, well, and, just put uh, 4,700 people on it and you'll be done in like three days, if yeah. my math is correct. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it was, uh, you know, it, it was daunting, uh, that's for sure. Um, but our API was in GraphQL and uh, we realized that we could leverage that uh, to do this incremental rewriting. By, was it, uh, well, GraphQL, yeah. did that even exist when you first wrote this thing? Or uh, that's a, no. something you're adding with a new architecture? Uh, it existed It existed before the new architecture. So we were pretty early adopters of GraphQL. Um, mm -hmm. Around 2016 was our first uh, GraphQL interface. And we've been migrating all of our um, REST-like APIs over to GraphQL slowly over that time. So we were about 70% of the way there when we decided to rewrite. So part of that was then in order to even get to a point where we could rewrite to pure GraphQL is that we had to take all those old REST-like endpoints and move them to GraphQL and move the clients to GraphQL. Uh, and uh, so that was like pre-work for the rewrite. Hmm. Uh, now, help me understand to the. Um, I've done rewrites before, and one of the challenges is that uh, you want to make sure you don't break anything. Or probably the mm -hmm. biggest challenge, actually, yeah. is uh, you, while you're rearchitecting this, while you're writing it, rewriting it. Um, how are you ensuring that was what was functional before is still functional now? Sure. So this is you know because we have multiple services, we put a gateway in front of it, so the client doesn't need to know. I need to talk to this service or this service or this service. I just talk okay. to the gateway. Okay. And the gateway then takes all of the different GraphQL schemas, stitches them together, and then um, when you make a request, it goes off to all the different services, asks for what it needs, and comes back. Hmm. Um, and so we're using a technology called Apollo Federation, uh, which, uh, which allows us to do that. Um, but that doesn't really answer your question on how we make sure that we didn't break anything. And so what we did is we, we took Apollo Federation and we built a side-by-side -side testing system that goes along with that. So the idea is we'll call this big chunk of code, this legacy code, the monolith, right? Right. And everything is currently in the monolith. Thousands and thousands of models and fields are in this monolith API. And so I want to take one of these models fields and move it over to this other service. I start the service up. I create basically an extension of that model that says, you know, let's say username on the user model. I would create a user service that has a user model with a user name field. And right away, I would just, I would put a decorator on it that says this is a migrated field, um, but it's manual. So meaning if somebody go, comes to the site and asks, if a, if a client asks for user.username, it's gonna to go to the gateway and it's gonna say, oh, I'm gonna get that from the monolith. If I wanted to test that it works against my service, I would use a query parameter that says I want to go to the manual schema, essentially. Hmm. And it will get everything from that user from the monolith, except for the username. It'll go to the user service. Hmm. And so I can test it. But me just testing it isn't enough. I need really to hammer this, right? And so that comes the second stage. I take that decorator that's on the service and I move it from manual to side by side. Mm -hmm. And what that tells our gateway to do is make a request to both places, compare the result, and if there's a difference, log it. Mm -hmm. And so we move it into side by side. Um, it doesn't wait on that service. That service can take forever. It doesn't block, but it will do a comparison and log it if there's a difference. And so now I get to run in prod with my data, get millions and millions of requests a day, but never actually see the client. And if there's a problem, 
I'm going to know. I'm going to get the report the next day that says, hey, there was a mismatch here. Um, you know, you need to fix this. And then I go fix the problem and deploy that. And then we're going against the fixed version. And eventually, it's going to come out clean. And then I can go into the third phase. I change that decorator to say it's not side by side anymore. It's now migrated. Right. And what this does is it tells the gateway to get everything that you asked for from the monolith, but this one field we're going to get from the service, and then it's going to stitch it together and send it down to the client. Now I'm serving production traffic from both places. 99% mm -hmm. of it is coming from the monolith, and 1% of it is coming from this service. If anything goes bad, if we have a scalability problem, if we have a data access problem, if we're just having all sorts of errors that we don't understand, we can revert that change and go back to okay. the other system. It's just a tiny little configuration change goes back. But once I'm happy, once I know it's good, that's the final stage where I delete it from the Python and I remove the decorator on the service. Now it's done. It's the federator knows how to send the traffic to the different services. And I've now moved that one piece of data, which sometimes comes with behavior, to the service. And then we do it again. Now we might go to the user's address. And, and that. Yeah, and eventually you know, you're doing 75%, 50%, 100% are all coming from the new system. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. We are currently 41% of the fields have moved to the new architecture. Yeah, you mentioned some behavior, uh, which is, um, mm -hmm. when you say that, I, I think of business rules. There's some, uh, mm -hmm. it's not just you're getting a data and you expect the value of the username to be Brian. Uh, you there's some other rules that have to account for mm -hmm. um and the, i've as i've done migrations like this uh, or not at the scale but um one of the challenges is just knowing what those business rules are if you've got a set of automated tests in place already which it sounds like you have some but not all mm -hmm. then you can just run those those contain the business rules but if not you've got to rely on figuring out what those business rules are which is a manual process which by its mm -hmm. nature is imperfect are you running into that mm -hmm. challenge yeah yeah so you know, ideally, the monolith has unit tests. And so when we can, we are going to port the code as is over to Go. Okay. So if we have unit tests, we're going to port the unit tests. And then we're going to port the code, watch it pass. Usually, then we're going to add some more unit tests because we're there and it's a good time to do so. Um, that That gets us, you know, 80, 90% of the way there. Um, the side-by-side -side testing, though, is where you're hammering it with pretty much every possible input. Like, you know, the case of username, we have 3 million users a day that come to our site. Sure. That's a lot of data that we're comparing. <laughs> yeah. um, and to some extent, we just figure if the shape of the data is exactly the same, If the business rules are not exactly the same, but the output, the input and the output is exactly the same, we're, we're happy. Um, and so this means sometimes that there is business rules that we don't port over. It means that those are pretty much dead business rules. Okay, fair enough. Right? If, if, if you don't, if you're looking at it and saying, hey, you know, this is, this isn't necessary to make this, these tests pass. You know, you see this all the time in your code. It's dead code. You just mm -hmm. don't realize it. And we can val validate that if we run, you know, if we run, a mil you know, 3 million users a day and run this for a week, you know, you've got 20 million requests and it's good. It, it's going to be pretty good, right? I mean, if there isn't, if there is an edge case, then it probably wasn't that important. And right. so that's kind of the way we think about it. Um, like if Prince, when he was alive, if he had signed up and had to sign it with that, that glyph yeah. that he's changed his name to, that would be an yeah. edge case. That would be the edge <laughs> case, maybe. But like, if we allow it, he's not the only one making those edge cases. You know, if maybe. you've got millions and millions of users, <laughs> if there is actually that edge case, if it right. is actually there, um, and we missed it, well, now we have a bug. 
but uh, I will say that this process, I said we're about 41% complete with migration mm -hmm. of those fields. Um, that is not the type of thing we're running into. That's not the, those aren't the challenges that we're running what, into. What's the big, what are the big challenges? Um, scalability of the new architecture have been the biggest problems to, to overcome. Uh, you know, how does, how, there's a lot of things that, uh, that, that encompasses, but, you know, uh, for example, um, we relied on an, in, uh, basically a Redis server that, uh, didn't scale properly because of the way that Google had, um, configured that service. Cause, uh, we run on app engine and app engine is a platform as a service. And so they give us a, um, a caching layer that we can use. Mm -hmm. And we started bringing our services up, and uh, it started failing on us. So we had to overcome that. Um, or that gateway, for example. The gateway is taking all of the traffic. Right. And, you know, every once in a while, we're going to get, like, we, we get 30-second um, latencies. Because that's gateways. a bottleneck. And we don't know why. Yeah, and we have to go figure it out. And we're getting into the the Node.js layer at that point because the Apollo server was written in in, in Node. Um, you know, and we're going and figuring that out and realizing that it um, again has to do with the infrastructure that we're sitting on. It's right. a new architecture on the same infrastructure. So you know, in many ways, we've solved the problems for the old architecture on this infrastructure, but we can't really conceive <laughs> of the new problems that the until, new architecture until they happen. Un... <laughs> exactly. Um, not to mention that in this upgrade, we are also upgrading all of our APIs to the new platform APIs of App Engine. And so there are subtleties there that, um, hmm. that cause, uh, you know, that cause issues that we need to solve. And so those are the sorts of things that we're running into. It's not hey, we missed an edge case. Um, this process is covering edge cases uh, really quite solidly. I see. Um, you mentioned uh, that you were um, uh, getting rid of some unused code, which I, I really like. I like the idea of sim using this as an opportunity to simplify your code. But what about, are you adding anything as you're, in the, as you're migrating? Do you think, you know what would be cool is let's add this new <laughs> feature, this new business rule while we're <laughs> migrating. Um, so when we started, we created a document of guidelines. Uh -huh. And one of those is no new behavior. Like if there's new behavior, it's a feature that other people are working on in the new service. It's not, hey, I'm going to add this change as we move over. If there's a bug in the Python, we are making sure that that bug exists in the Go. With some exceptions, of course. But okay. the reason for that is because we we want the system to be the same. We want right. the clients, if they rely on the bug behavior or you know inadvertently rely on the bug, bug behavior, let's say, let's say for example, uh, returns null intended, instead of empty string, and we're like, oh, this should really return empty string, but the client is checking for null, <laughs> right. and all of a sudden you've broken the client. And right. so, no, um, if you're moving the code over, we're not, we're not trying to make it better. We're not trying to add features. We're not trying to add behavior. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, we need to create new features. Like this is a long time to not have new features. Right. And so when we do that, we're trying to do it in the new service so we don't have to port it. Okay. Um, and uh, that does come with its own logistical problems. What if that service isn't ready <laughs> for you to write the new feature in? Um, because the things that it relies on aren't there. Like at that point, you actually have to call back to the monolith to get some of the information and behavior that you need to get working. And that can, you know, that can be its own nastiness. And so in some cases we say, no, we can't add this new behavior today. Right. We're going to wait until the service gets to a certain threshold that we can. So, yeah. Tell me about some of the tooling that you're using to make your life easier. Sure. Well, you know, I I like IDEs um, personally. Me too. So, 
So uh, I'm using the um, the IntelliJ uh, equivalent for Go, which is called uh, GoLand. Um, it uh, it makes running unit tests super easy and debugging unit tests super easy and uh, attaching to services and doing debugging. Um, I am somebody who believes that a debugger is a useful tool. Um, totally. Um, and uh, and so I, I like my IDE for that. I like I like my code navigation. I like all of that. So personally, I like using that. Is that from JetBrains? That's JetBrains. Yes, it is. Um, and then uh, so that's you know as I'm developing, um, you know I I like doing I like using the side by side behavior that I talked about in development. So I can get a sense for what's going to go wrong before I put it into prod. So after I've written all the code, after I've written all the tests, after I've really kind of convinced myself that it's good, I'll turn side by side on locally and I'll run that. Um, and very often I'll find, oh look, this one ha this this URL is schemaless and this one is HTTPS and that's a difference um, between those two endpoints that I need to fix and you know that that keeps me from having to deploy something, wait a day, see the report, and so on. Um, you know, but you know, other other than that, uh, you know, that's kind of it's kind of the the workflow. Like it's really a code driven workflow. Um, we our deploy process is um, is chat driven, so we have a Slack bot basically that does our deploys for us. So once I'm ready to go, I get into a queue by just saying, "Hey, I want to go." We we do uh, essentially continuous deployment, so we do a good 12 to 15 deploys a day. Um, you know, the company's West Coast, and I'm East Coast, so I get up early right. and I, I, I get in the queue before anyone else is waiting, which is nice. Um, yeah, that's why you're more wide awake than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an early riser. Yeah, I, I had a like, I had a deploy this morning at uh, at about 5 a.m. Eastern time, which is what two o'clock. Um, for <laughs> everybody in California, so uh, yeah, but but the tooling's strong and it, it handles it, and I was able to monitor everything myself and make sure that uh, I didn't have any scaling problems and such. So, so yeah, that's you know that that's 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 like the basics around it. You know, there's you know like any given development environment, there's there's a lot of things involved there, but uh, in many ways our our DevOps team gives us a development environment, and I just work on it. I, it's okay. kind of abstracted from. That sounds safer. Is there anything that you're not going to migrate? Uh, yeah, you know, this was more of a product uh, management call than it was an engineering call. Uh, but we had to look at the entire space of everything that we did, and ask ourselves, what is most important, um, and. We looked at it from uh, what we what we're calling the minimal viable experience. Um, we didn't want to call it a minimal viable product because we already have a product. What is the experience that if we took this part away, it would no longer be Khan Academy? Right. Right. Um, and you know, content of course, content delivery <laughs> is is going to be one of those things. But user management is necessary for Khan Academy to still be the product it is. Um, yeah, we never actually said this, but Khan Academy is uh, online training. That, uh, a lot of teachers use it, and a lot of uh, mm -hmm. individuals use it upskill. But <laughs> I think yeah, people, I'm, it's ubiquitous. Not most people know <laughs> that, but it's yeah. worth saying. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's an online education company, um, free for everyone, everywhere. We're a nonprofit. Um, just trying to trying to like educate the world, um, and so content cool. is our bread and butter. I should have and, asked you that at the beginning. <laughs> what's that? I should have asked you that at the start of this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's no, it's no problem. Um, I'm more here to talk about this thing that we're doing than yeah, <laughs> than the company itself. But um, the company's awesome, um, and uh, and yeah, but content is our bread and butter. So that makes it into the minimal viable experience. Uh, user management, uh, classroom teacher tools, assignments, all of, all of these things that are part of um, the core experience, the minimal viable experience, that has to get done first. If Google turns off the ability to run Python 2.7 tomorrow, what do we need to have done? And so we've we've come up with this core and. 
you know, it's a 10 year old product with a lot of users. So it was hard to pare that down. I mean, that still yeah. covers a good 60 to 70% of our code base is what we right. consider to be minimal viable experience. And then after that, there's the P1s, the P2s and the P3s. There's um, a prior priority one? Yes, I'm sorry, okay. priority, uh, priority one, two and three sections. And we've decided that as a company, as an engineering effort, uh, we nobody moves on to their P1 features until the MVE is done. Got it. So if I'm on a team that's that's finished the MVE, I'm going to go to another team and help them finish Got it. until the entire MVE is done. And then we as an entire organization move on to the next phase. Um, because you know, it, we we have some assurances from Google that they're not going to turn us off right away, which is good. Uh, but we also don't have any assurance on when that day is that they're not going to uh, um, yeah. keep us going. And so uh, we have to think about it that way. And um, in that process also included the won't do's. We were able to look at the product and say there are features that we don't believe fits our mission anymore or yeah. our pedagogy. Um, there are certain things like we had we had a feature for streaks, for example. It would it would tell you how many days in a row you logged in, um, and a small number of our users really loved that feature. But our pedagogy says Khan Academy isn't a thing that you have to or should be using every single day. It's a supplemental resource um, for learning. It's not your primary education source necessarily. Um, some people, independent you, learners, will definitely use it that way, but we don't want to encourage this streak behavior because it's it's pe it's not pedagogically sound. And so we looked at that feature and said, you know, we don't have to port that behavior. We're going to sunset that behavior, which is its own effort, right? You can't just like be like, I'm not going to port it, and then eventually, it just doesn't work. Um, you know, there's a there's communication strategies, and then there's right. obviously deleting the code and testing that you didn't break other things and all that stuff. So there's still an engineering um, effort, but it's significantly smaller than porting it and yeah. maintaining it. So, yeah. So those are the types of things we didn't bring over. Brian, we're almost at time. Is there anything we haven't talked about that is really important? No, I really, I really wanted to talk about this incremental approach. I think. Um, I I was really surprised and have learned a lot about how powerful it can be. Um, I I've sent you the a blog post that we talk about it at a high level. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm actually looking um, at it right now. And uh, uh, perhaps you can link it. Uh, but I it, um, I'll, it, I'll put it right down below the picture here. Yeah, it's a neat strategy, and uh, and and I would encourage people to look at it. Yeah, you. Don't, I don't think you need GraphQL to make a strategy like this work, uh, but I think. A strategy. I, this is actually. This even comes down to tactics. Like this tactic is, has I think really proven to be uh, a powerful tool for, um, for such a massive rewrite. And I uh, just kind of wanted to talk about how cool it is. It is cool. I learned something myself. Brian, thank you so much for your time. You stay safe. Yeah. You too. <laughs>